All right. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stephen Turner, who, as Harry has just reminded me, is one of ISTC's original members, a member in long and good standing. Stephen is the Distinguished University Professor at the University of South Florida. When, in his opening remarks, Harry mentioned that contemporary social theory is interdisciplinary or post-disciplinary, Professor Turner's work immediately came to my mind. His scholarship is remarkable both for its breadth and its rigor, combining the best of the disciplines of sociology and philosophy. This interdisciplinary perspective is particularly evident, I think, in his groundbreaking The Social Theory of Practices, and more recently in Explaining the Normative works that I personally have found very helpful. He has also written extensively about democracy in theory and in practice in his Liberal Democracy 3.0 and in The Politics of Expertise. And this is the topic of his talk today, which is provocatively entitled Against Democratic Theory. Please welcome Stephen Turner. Uh, great, thank you. Well, it's great to be here, and I must, you know, I'm sure Lou Beer is here, but this has been a great conference, and he deserves a lot of credit for what he's put together here. The kind of interaction I'm seeing is primo, excellent uh, exchanges, and uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. Okay, so Against Democratic Theory is, uh, sounds like a provocative title, but you'll see it's really not so provocative. What's more provocative is the phenomenon of democratic theory itself. So what is democratic theory? Um, there really wasn't any such thing in the US uh, prior to uh, roughly World War II. And uh, people argue a bit about where this concept comes from. But uh, uh, my, my story is that um, there are sort of two key sources. Uh, one is Carl Friedrich. Carl Friedrich is a uh, very, uh, uh, one of these really important uh, transitional figures who uh, um, was a refugee from uh, Nazi Germany, but he was kind of uh, on the uh, sort of uh, uh, authoritarian liberal side, he wasn't exactly on the right, but he was very congenial to, uh, he found Harvard's uh, sort of Cambridge authoritarianism, very congenial. He was one of the prime movers in getting the Harvard faculty uh, um, interested in uh, the war in Europe and uh, opposed to isolationism. And Talcott Parsons was a big friend of his on uh, a committee to do this. But he promoted a very specific view of um, uh, the justification of authority in a whole series of uh, uh, books, which was anti-Weberian. So he said, oh, yes, I respect the Weber so much, blah, blah, blah. But, and then, they, then he goes Kantian on him and says that the, what he missed out on was uh, the fact that the authority can be rationally justified. And there's a difference between rationally, rational authority, rationally justified authority, and just plain authority or authority based on faith or whatever. Uh, so this is actually the, the beginning of the worm and the apple. It looks innocent, but it, it, doesn't, it turns out not to be so innocent. The other uh, key figure here is Robert Dahl, who's usually tagged as the uh, originator of this uh, uh, topic. And uh, he starts out as a kind of critical, critic of, or he ends up as a critic of uh, the US Constitution. And, uh, argues that it's not democratic enough. So you can see there's a, a normative thing here. But he started out uh, criticizing models of, uh, that he essentially invented, Madisonian and populist models of democracy, which he said didn't accurately represent what went on in actual American politics, which he thought was polyarchy. 
Okay, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm going to really concern myself with uh, uh, some really big ideas and uh, um, the way this interacts with uh, more recent European stuff. Okay, so the core idea of democratic theory was that there was a something that was really democratic that you could say, you could look at a particular regime and say, well, this is kind of democratic, but it's not really democratic yet. And so then they needed an out idea of what really democratic was, so they had to kind of abstract this from, uh, this essence from actual democratic practice to show what the real democratic uh, kernel within it actually was, or else uh, derive it from uh, uh, ideology and hold the actual practice to the standard of the ideology. The basic idea was that there was some kind of standard of rationality, justice, or correct political justification that uh, would be, represent real democracy, and that the, you could have a democratic theory, which is all then a critical theory, uh, to appeal to. So here's just standard uh, uh, examples. I mean, Dahl, Dahl says this is a utopian list, meaning nobody has ever gotten there yet. But this is the list, the pretty standard kinds of, uh, of descriptions. Now what you notice about this list is that it is um, uh, the conditions of democracy are really uh, conditions also of liberalism. So uh, not only must people have, and, not, and you also notice that equal turns up repeatedly in this uh, uh, list, um, but there needs to be deliberation and there needs to be some opportunity to decide what political matters actually are and so on and so forth, which are uh, sort of conditions of speech rather than uh, conditions of uh, equality. But equality is a big part of the utopian idea of, uh, of, of democratic theory. So it's a critique because um, that's not how things really work. Really, uh, uh, advanced countries are polyarchies. They have elected all of this stuff that are the conditions of, uh, the formal conditions of uh, uh, democracy. And uh, that's a good thing, but uh, the result is that they end up creating multiple centers of political power, and what they don't uh, achieve is equality. So the whole uh, equal, equal, equal parts of this uh, don't happen. You have instead uh, multiple power centers that uh, check each other. Um, okay, so this critique eventually uh, slips into another kind of critique, uh, which um, is the sort of the shadow job of uh, political philosophy or uh, um, in the post-1950 era which was to figure out a justification for the welfare state. And uh, the basic uh, idea was that uh, uh, justice and equality of outcomes were uh, equal. This could be then defined in various ways. And to get some background to this, they, there was a lot of interest in going back to Weimar socialists, uh, Herman Heller, and so forth, as uh, uh, um, especially as interpreters of the last part of the Weimar Constitution, the, the promissory uh, social part, which promised all kinds of uh, uh, equality without actually uh, guaranteeing. So, uh, paradoxically, all of these political thinkers think of themselves as defenders of social democracy. Real democracy is social democracy. And, uh, um, but, Social democracy is also not socialism. So that the odd thing that happens here historically is that um, um, the welfare states that actually occurred were a purely a historical accident. Bismarck, uh, you have credited as the author of the welfare state, he was certainly no socialist, and his idea was basically, you give people a stake in the system, they're not gonna revolt. And so you guarantee a bunch of things for them, health care, uh, old age pensions, and so forth, uh, they're going to uh, acquiesce. And um, uh, nobody uh, gave a philosophical justification of that particular 
deal. So once the uh, uh, welfare states of the, uh, and the other part of the story is that when socialist parties actually came into power in Europe, it was especially obvious in the case of Lamb, Bloom in France, um, the expectations of the workers were that immediately socialism would follow and paradise would uh, uh, follow immediately after socialism. And of course, uh, Bloom knew perfectly well that this even going in that direction, even if he knew what the direction was, would cause a civil war, so he didn't go there. But where they did go was more extensive welfare uh, provision. And in Britain, the story is slightly uh, different, but uh, uh, there, um, again, it was uh, closely related to the sacrifices of the war and the idea that there was an obligation to the working class, and um, um, also the idea that uh, actually uh, taking the money from the rich and giving it to the poor wouldn't really help that much because the rich didn't really have that much money. It might help a little bit, but not enough. So the idea which uh, Tawney uh, promoted was that the state would provide a lot of services, and that would be the, the uh, contribution of the welfare state. So that was something that also doesn't have any justification in socialist theory. It's not socialism. It's something else. And uh, so what we had was this accidental product of history, a new kind of uh, regime without any big philosophical justification. So it became the job of uh, democratic theory to give this kind of uh, justification. The problem with the, the whole project of democratic theory is um, pretty straightforward. It's anti-democratic. So the whole point of democratic theory is to complain about actually existing democracy. That's what makes it uh, critical. And it has to be something that, therefore, the people in those actually de existing democracies, using the voting mechanisms that they actually have, did not choose. Um, now, um, yeah, so, you know, when you look at what, what kinds of regimes people actually choose, they're not such great <laughs> choices, uh, but they're the ones that they, they chose. So uh, either you have to take away their democratic privilege to choose those things, or you have to accept that, well, maybe that's really what uh, democracy means for those people. I, the, my favorite example of uh, how this problem comes up is uh, has, comes from these followers of Hegel who were uh, uh, trying themselves to develop a, a theory of political representation and uh, came up with the puzzle of, okay, well, what does the representative represent? Well, he's got a constituency, but what is he supposed to do? Well, he's supposed to act in accordance with reason, of course, because there are Hegelians. So there is this thing called reason. Uh, there's a standard there, and that's what the representative is supposed to, to act in accordance with. So why do they need representation at all if all they're going to do is act in accordance with reason? And indeed, why do you need democracy at all if you're just going to act in accordance with reason? Why do you even need consent? Because in a way, you can assume that people that don't consent are unreasonable and need to be uh, uh, changed anyway. So, um, yeah, so democratic theory, said, so somebody actually articulated this, uh, Hans Kelsen, in these, these two very long essays that were published in Ethics in uh, the early 50s. And his line, uh, which was against uh, not an, uh, either of these guys, but another, a very obscure German, um, which he used as a sort of a whipping boy, but it wasn't really a straw man. It was a sort of a well-stuffed man. Um, and uh, um, his line as a legal positivist was, look, uh, democracy is the rule of the people. We, we all can agree on that. Uh, but the rule of the people has to be ruled through legal procedures. There's no other kind of rule of the people. And uh, therefore, democracy is nothing more or less than the legal procedures which allow people to vote. Those vary, uh, but there's no essence to it. It's just a kind of, of uh, procedure. And his point was, it's undemocratic to appeal, and he's quite explicit about this, to appeal to such things as the will of the people apart from the procedures of expressing it. There's just no such thing. This was Faber's view as well. He said, uh, for me, uh, 
the will of the people is a myth. Um, okay, so uh, we have a real conflict here between uh, ideas of democracy, which is supposed to be the real thing, and the people, uh, what, what act actually democracy uh, produces. Now, an, an aspect of this uh, problem is, uh, uh, well, pretty soon we're going to see how this all drives, uh, drives us into the wall, but uh, uh, part of the problem has to do not so much with democracy, but with liberalism. Um, and this is a, uh, a tradition that Dahl certainly contributed to. I'm going to call it the problems of liberalism tradition. And it's basically there are a whole series of issues that are paradoxes within liberalism, where if you take uh, liberal principles to one extreme or another, they begin to defeat themselves and uh, uh, become unworkable. Uh, Voltaire... Uh, of coined the phrase, no freedom for the enemies of freedom. And I think most of them are sort of variations on that. The liberal state has to defend itself. So it can't be freedom for the enemies of the liberal state. You've got to have something in addition to uh, freedom for everybody. It's a similar one is uh, involves secrecy. The liberal state is supposed to be based on free discussion. That's the whole point of liberalism. Uh, but it needs secrecy to protect itself. So it can't have free discussion about everything. Um, and uh, um, you, you can go on and, and deal with this in terms of cases like hate speech and say that, well, this undermines rational persuasion, needs to be regulated in order to, to have rational discussion, and uh, therefore it can't be free. Now, liberalism is just full of these uh, uh, problems and um, um, yeah, so, but there's, there's sort of a more basic uh, problem with democracy itself. It has to do with the idea of forms of state. So this is Derrida, who I'll go back to. Uh, in order for there, there to be the rule of the people and them to actually rule, it has to rely on some sort of sovereignty, because sovereignty is rule, the equivalent to rule. So sovereignty and democracy are inseparable but contradictory partners. Efficacy depends on sovereignty, uh, and uh, if there wasn't sovereignty, it would be uh, defeated and the people wouldn't uh, rule anymore. This is similar to the, these problems of liberalism. Okay, so if we look at democracy in relation to liberalism, it seems as though, and even Dahl uh, acknowledges this, you need a bunch of auxiliary machinery. And it's got to include more or less these standard liberal uh, ideas. Uh, and these are all ideas involving the form of, uh, forms of a, a state. Uh, but this machinery is not necessarily popular. So these are sort of rules of the game that uh, have to be accepted by the people, but the people may or may not uh, choose to accept them. <clears throat> they don't have a democratic justification directly. Um, they depend on things like people's belief in the Constitution, or their rights, or uh, in various other things, but they're not based in a direct sense on the people or the will of the people. People like Dewey were very hostile to uh, things like constitutionalism and these things like natural right doctrines in the name of democracy. So he saw that, that these auxiliary mechanisms that in some sense were supports of democracy could also serve as uh, enemies of democracy, at least in this sort of abstract sense of there being a will of the people or something democratic that goes beyond just voting. Um, so, in any case, these, these kinds of um, uh, auxiliary measures tend to generate these uh, anomalies like the uh, no freedom um, for the enemies of freedom. But if we, if we sort of begin to look at this as, in, um, uh, as, as a system, more sociologically rather than just as political theory, you can see that uh, liberalism and liberal democracy is actually pretty 
intricate and fragile system. It really depends on people honoring the spirit of uh, the arrangements, has to tolerate a lot of political disagreement. Uh, where there is discretion, the, the uh, um, bureaucrats and office holders need to be more or less politically neutral. That is, they don't use their powers uh, of discretion against one party or another. And um, it, this system of these auxiliary measures are easily seen as an obstacle in real or imagined emergencies. So freedom of speech looks like if we're in a war situation, uh, this is a problem that people are running around saying things that are hostile to the, the war effort, and therefore we have to uh, um, get rid of it. However, and, and it also needs something like consensus, or at least consensus on the rules of the game, on what people's rights are, and so on. And this consensus is pretty easy to erode. Um, and um, the consensus isn't really neutral. It's got some value content. But we have to treat it as neutral. We have to treat it as non-political and not really subject to uh, um, dispute. Um, so that makes all of those things fragile. But liberal democracy can be really resilient if a few things happen. And uh, my, my pet example of this is, uh, uh, and, and this is why it's so resilient. Any arrangement, any state arrangement, uh, creates interest in preserving that arrangement. Somebody benefits from it. And uh, uh, then the political parties cater to the, that interest, even if it's just an accidental consequence of something. Um, and it can also change to cater to new interests or create new interests. So it's flexible in uh, creating uh, allowing people, politicians and actually incentivizing politicians to um, uh, create support for the system. Um, my, my pet example of this is uh, freedom of speech. So who is the great defender of freedom of speech nowadays? Well, how if you wouldn't have a pornography industry, uh, we wouldn't have near as robust defenses of freedom of speech because they're the ones that provide the lawyers for uh, all of those cases that come up. Uh, and uh, so why? So one uh, set of judicial decisions created a whole industry, and that industry has its interests and its, it, uh, has its political impact, and uh, it preserves the system, even though you would never think of pornography as a support of liberalism, but there it is. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then it also depends on not having totalizing uh, parties. This is kind of Schmittian point. Uh, if parties have ideal interests or some sort of vision that's different, uh, and uh, also material interests, that is, they deliver some goods for their supporters, but are not either one exclusively, um, you can have the kinds of compromises in political discussion that's characteristic of uh, liberal democracy. But if you don't have that, if you have totalizing parties, the system is going to break down and it, because it's so fragile in the first place. OK, so this is why liberalism uh, in these is, in a way, uh, anti-democratic. If democracy is rule in accordance with the will of the people, but in this abstract sense that goes beyond the formal legal will that uh, Kelsen was interested in, um, these auxiliaries, these rights and procedures and so forth, get in the way of the, the people ruling in this uh, sovereign sense that uh, uh, Derrida is talking about. Um, and when you're, uh, when we um, critique these, these sort of what I'm calling these auxiliaries, um, and a democratic theory has a kind of circularity to it, where um, it says, well, those procedures were never truly democratic in the first place, so they aren't really uh, democratic now. They were, they were put, put in place by slaveholders and uh, uh, white males, and therefore the Constitution isn't really, uh, doesn't really have any democratic uh, credentials. Um, so, this notion of truly democratic, or the idea that there's some sort of imminent sense that we can derive uh, through democratic theory, has some role in this uh, critique. But the, the, po the real point is that uh, 
these critiques are, are anti-democratic in the, in the literal sense uh, by design, because the, um, if, if the goal is any particular vision of true democracy, then all of these devices, rights, and whatnot um, are obstacles to the realization of whatever uh, true democracy is. They're conservative, uh, uh, these auxiliaries, because they get in the way of any kind of transformational change by way of something like uh, collective effervescence. So this is, uh, and I'm going to come back to this, because this turns out to be a really important part of uh, recent uh, French political thinking. Um, and in any case, they preserve this uh, uh, sort of corrupt looking politics of interest bargaining and minor uh, ideological variations. So if democracy is all about transcending that and transcending the polyarchy and so forth that is characteristic of uh, uh, liberal democratic regimes, then um, uh, they, these things all have to be swept away. Now, where this pushes us, if we're critiquing the existing democratic order in the name of uh, true democracy or some higher ideal of, uh, of democracy, um, it's anti-democratic because this isn't what people actually vote for or would vote for. And in a way, and we'll see later, that this is more or less acknowledged by these theorists, uh, and what it puts us, pushes it toward is sort of two directions. One is uh, acclamation as a model of the expression of democratic will. And the other is uh, expert rule. So it's like the, the Friedrich side of the story is uh, there's rational justification for, for um, authority. And the rational justification is really that, hey, these people are the experts. Um, the um, alternative is some kind of, of uh, mass public uh, acclamation. And there's a surprising amount of uh, uh, literature having to do with the idea of uh, radical transformation uh, through some kind of uh, sort of public uh, mass expression. Okay, so uh, let's just step back a little bit here. The problem of, of liberalism and democracy, and therefore the problem of democratic theory, is that maybe democracy and all of these auxiliary measures are fundamentally incompatible. It's not just incompatible in theory, but that eventually this, this uh, theoretical <coughs> incompatibility will play out in such a way that through the ordinary mechanisms of democracy, you'll abolish the auxiliary <coughs> measures that uh, are uh, the measures that preserve liberalism. And that was Schmidt's basic idea, that basically when, if, if you give uh, everybody the vote, pretty soon they'll vote all of this stuff about freedom of speech and freedom of rights and so forth. They'll just vote it away. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want it. Uh, and partly this was, the idea was that the, they would just vote in socialism. And that was more or less Schumpeter's idea as well, that uh, uh, people, would be gulled into uh, um, voting on socialism, and they were ba uh, basically too stupid to figure out that it wasn't in their own interest. Uh, Weber had more or less the same views. Um, uh, Alfred Van uh, uh basically predicted that uh, um, in about 1910 that um, the expansion of the franchise in Britain would lead to uh, a kind of politics that was simply about dividing up the pie and uh, no longer worth fighting about. And you know, this really goes back to the uh, Putney Green debates as well, where the question was, uh, okay, what would you do if you had uh, an equal vote other than to, uh, expropriate from everybody else? Um, okay, so that's the idea, that, that if, if you really gave the people uh, power, all they would do is grab uh, uh, disrupt the system and destroy the system uh, as it, it, it uh, occurred. So what we had instead, that didn't happen. We had the welfare state itself, and this is full of paradoxes. So uh, the welfare state really depends on capitalism, the taxation of the rich, and therefore the rich. So it requires significant inequality. 
And it probably, and there's an argument that would uh, take a long time to uh, uh, specify, uh, probably depends on a very complex financial system that uh, is going to benefit uh, some people in the 0.1% category. So the welfare state is in a kind of marriage in, uh, from hell with finance capitalism. Um, OK, so uh, nobody would have, have uh, uh, argued for that particular uh, solution. But it's a pragmatic <coughs> compromise. It's stable, coexists with finance capitalism, and that's, it's what we've got. Social democracy, which is the ideal of these people want to, to, are most uh, concerned with, are, is all about solidarity. So it, uh, but the problem with it is it presumes more solidarity than it exists. It assumes people are workers rather than your dependents. And also that when people choose, um, they, or the reality is that when people choose, they'd rather have more money than more equality. So people don't actually choose uh, of these regimes. Um, okay, so so if you're a democratic theorist, this is sort of a problem for you. The people don't do what you want them to do, and uh, you have to explain why the people do don't do what they want you to do. And the answers turn out to be, well, they'd really like it if they weren't brainwashed into being materialists and uh, you know uh, by the culture industry and whatnot. And these are basically uh, um, a circular arguments. So you know in advance what the solution is, that what they should want, and you criticize them for uh, and explain away why they don't actually want this. Um, OK, so we've still got all of these interests that are created, this vast structure of interests that's created by liberal democracy. And they, that stands in the way of radical change. Um, so it's a very difficult system uh, to change. The people don't have the right attitudes, and there are too many interests that stand in the way of, of uh, changing it. Um, so, uh, the um, yeah. So, what's the alternative? Well, it's very discouraging if you're a, if this kind of democratic theorist. The, the world is pretty recalcitrant to you, uh, and you're looking for some kind of. Uh, a big change that would really produce uh, the right kind of democracy. So there are a whole series of these thinkers that uh, are interested in both radical change and democracy, and uh, uh, but recognize that you can't do it within the present uh, system. So what's the alternative? Well, most of them, Moose is an exception, are uh, looking for a moment. And so in a lot of recent French thinkers, there's a lot of fascination with St. Paul. And it's the idea is that there's going to be a, a keros, an opening in history where you can have radical change. But the vision of this is this moment of acclamation and, and what you know, in Durkheimian terms is collective effervescence, where uh, people's viewpoints and their attitudes themselves change. And if there's an event that somehow brings this about, then you could have a radical change. But without that event, you don't really have that radical change. Now, you can have this sort of long march through the institutions, and that is uh, Chantal Mousse's uh, uh, line. But it also involves uh, some model of a collective will. And, uh, uh, but, but, you know, as she says, we need to ask how this people needs to be created in order to foster democratic politics. So for her, there isn't even a people yet to rule. We just have procedures in liberal democracy, but no rule by the people. So uh, this line of critique, which is democratic critique of actual democracies, morphs in people like Badu into democracy is the enemy. So, uh, and Badu is actually quite interesting on this. Um, and he's the ultimate acclamation guy, only he gets it from uh, Lenin. And from the parts of State and Revolution where he's talking about the withering away of the state. And he's thinking about, OK, what are the conditions for the withering away of the state? Well, it would have to be some kind of moment that would transform people into the kinds of people 
who could live in anarchy, live without a state. So you can't get the withering away of the state without this kind of personal transformation. So the will, the wish here is for this moment of uh, radical uh, transformation, uh, which involves some kind of the creation of a new uh, reality. So here's the do. Proper politics <coughs> must revolve around the construction of great new fictions. Okay, this is right out of Sorel, uh, that create real possibilities for constructing dis <coughs> different socio-environmental futures. So this really gives up on normal democratic politics. There's no way you're going to do that there. Uh, great new fictions have to happen at some special moment and in sort of some moment of, of uh, collective uh, uh, transformation. Or for MOVE, this is uh, um, uh, the radicalization of existing institutions. Um, and uh, this looks like a more reasonable program. Uh, it's about transforming institutions, making them more accountable, more representative, um, which makes perfect sense, except that people right, uh, don't necessarily want those kinds of, uh, of uh, institutions. So it's still got the problem of, uh, of going against the current of actual voting. OK, so now we can expand this a little bit. Is it, phrase in Schmidt that uh, what is political is a political decision. Really important uh, uh, phrase. Uh, there is no limits to the political. It's a matter of decision, what we're going to treat as uh, political. So we can give a democratic version of this and uh, say that the, the people must have the opportunity to decide what political matters actually are and what should be brought up for deliberation. Um, so this is different from, say, constitutionalism, which sets the limits of what can be brought up for deliberation. It says the state can't go certain places. 